one day I realized uh, when I went surfing that the corals, they were dying. All the corals, they had turned white and I decided to do something. Hello and welcome to the Ocean Impact Podcast. I'm your host, Tim Silverwood. And our guest on the podcast today is the incredible Titawan Bernacott, who is the co-founder and CEO of Coral Gardeners. If you haven't come across Coral Gardeners on Instagram or other social media platforms, then where have you been hiding? It's probably one of the most captivating channels out there showing a generation of future leaders that are out there restoring and rehabilitating coral reefs around Tahiti in French Polynesia and doing so in part by the support of people all around the world who help them by adopting corals. Now we are in August 2021, which means if you're listening to this, we're extremely close to launching or we have launched the Ocean Impact Pitch Fest 2021. And you probably caught the news just recently that the cash prize for the winner of Pitch Fest this year is $50,000, no strings attached, cash in Australian dollars. And two runners up will get $10,000, no strings attached, cash. So you really wanna make sure this is on your radar this year. Applying is really simple. It's an online form followed by a three minute, up to three minute pitch video that you can record at home, you can record anywhere. So make sure you tell your friends and colleagues this is going to be huge this year. Back to the podcast with Titawin. Look, I just find these guys so inspirational. A big thing for me in my views of conservation is that you need to inspire people in order to be able to educate people in order to be able to then get people to act. So coral gardeners for me, they just do this in a spectacular fashion. Honestly, go and check out their campaigns online. See the incredible numbers that their content reaches. We're talking about over 100 million people that they interact with. The numbers are astronomical. They're raising really good money to support their conservation efforts. And Titawan is, what, about 20 years old? So purely inspir inspirational stuff from these guys. I'm a big fan. I'm sure you will be too after this podcast. Tito is tuning in from Tahiti. I'm tuning in from the northern beaches of Sydney. I hope you enjoy the chat. As always, thanks for tuning in to the Ocean Impact Podcast. Really happy to have on the Ocean Impact podcast today, Tituan Bernacott, who is the founder and CEO of Coral Gardeners, which um, I just find one of the most inspiring ocean conservation projects out there. Um, so really thrilled to have you on the podcast today. How are you? Hey, Tim, I'm fine. Thank you for having me today on the podcast here. Now, uh, I'd love to learn a little bit more about the origin story of Coral Gardeners and you as a conservationist. So why don't you sort of take us back a little bit through the journey um, and even a little bit about why the ocean is so intrinsic to your life, why you love the ocean so much? Yeah, sure. So I think my story with the ocean uh, started when I was just a little baby because uh, I had the uh, original uh, uh, early years of my life on a little pearl farm, so like a little bungalow on the middle of the lagoon of uh, Atoll in the Tuamutu Archipelago, so the remote islands in French Polynesia, where my parents, they were pearl farmers, so they were ha harvesting the Taishan pearls, and I was the only kid there. They were, there was no school, no shop, no doctor, no phone, only by radio. And there was a boat coming every month to give us the rice, the pastas, and the stuff we needed. And uh, my dad and mom, they were with all their pearl farmers team, like pirates, <laughs> harvesting the, the oyster and, and the pearls. And I was the only kid there. 
and I started um, joining my father every day. Like everything stopped at at 4 p.m., 5 p.m. after the job, and they jump in the boat and they go straight to the channel they call Tiari Roa. That's the place where they are the most fish, and they are obliged to catch some fish every day to eat because no shop, like there, there is nothing there. So I was watching my father and my uncles from the pear farm catching the dinner with my little buoys at the surface. And that's where I discovered the, the underwater world. Yeah. And after that, when my little brother, Ioane, was just born, we moved to the sister island of Tihiri called Mooria. And that's where I am today. And uh, growing up, the ocean was my playground. Just like you in Australia, we spent so much time surfing, spearfishing, freediving. And one day I realized... Uh, when I went surfing, that the corals, they were dying. All the corals, they had turned white, and I decided to do something. Yeah. Wow, it sounds like almost a movie. So you're out there <laughs> living with your parents and the rest of the pearl farmers like pirates in the middle of the ocean. That is surreal. Yeah, no, that's serious. I, they have so many crazy stories and I think I, I can't even realize how lucky I was to be able to like swim with all the black tip sharks learn how to to fish where before like even know how to walk and and having just my father um, getting everything we needed from from the ocean that's amazing so what was it that took your parents there in the first place why did they find themselves in the Tuamotus doing the pearl fishing, pearl farming? So my parents, they arrived to the Tuamotu archipelago in the 90s. And my dad knew someone at that time, kind of an uncle who, was, who had that, that, that house in the middle of the ocean. And they were growing oysters, but they weren't able to make pearls at that time. They didn't know the, the methodology and etc. So he asked to visit the pearl farm during 10 days. And... Uh, <laughs> During those 10 days, he, he start like living the, the true coral island lifestyle. And after that, he just uh, stayed 10 years. And my mom, five years, and myself from zero to three years old. And uh, he invest all his money at that time. He built kind of a business plan. And he say, okay, <laughs> let, let's make it ha happen. And his dream was to produce the most beautiful pearls in the world. So they work really hard. And during the first three years, they were only eating fish and rice every day, every night. And, um, and after a couple of years, they learned how to do the surgical operation and to harvest the pears, and they succeed. And that was some of the most beautiful uh, years of his life and for my family. And uh, after that, yeah, I needed to go at school, and there was nothing there. So that's why we moved to, to the island of Mooria. Yeah. Wow, what an incredible origin story. So you just gave us a little bit of an insight into when you came back and you started to see the reef that you obviously loved so dearly and were so connected to, you started to see it in decline. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about coral and what you witnessed there and what's happening with corals the world over and why corals are so, so important. Yeah, sure. I would say that everything started uh, when I was 16 years old. Uh, I took my little aluminum boat uh, with my little brother, Johanne, and a couple island friends, and we went surfing to the north side of our island. We arrived there, and that's the first day, first time ever that we noticed something really bizarre. All the beautiful, like, orange, pur purple posilopora corals uh, that uh, were under our feet surfing the last couple of years. For the first time, they were white. And with, with the friend, we were like really shocked. Like, what's going on, guys? And this same afternoon, I came back to my house and I typed on the internet, bleach coral. And I learned two things. Is that the first thing is that the corals, they were bleaching because of global warming, the rising temperatures of the oceans. And this means they were dying. And they where there was already half of the coral reef fall wide that uh, were already dead and um, they could be all gone by horizon 2050 could be the first ecosystem to collapse and the second thing i realized this day 
I was 16 years old, is that the corals, they weren't simple stones or rocks. They were living organism and they were giving my family, my friends and I everything we needed in our life from the best moments surfing the reef break waves to the, the dive, the, the reef sharks I dive with. They protect our islands from the storm, give us the food we eat. They bring the tourism, develop the economy of the country and more than a half of the oxygen uh, we breathe is coming from the oceans with healthy coral reef. <laughs> so that afternoon I was like, what is going on? Like around me, nobody's wa- nobody was talking around about it. And uh, I just felt like I found something just so beautiful. The corals, they are animals with tentacles and, and a symbiotic relationship with a tiny zooxanthellae algae, giving the color and also the energy to the coral. And they are so complex and diverse reef ecosystems and they are so important. So I found uh, for the first time a, a topic that was really talking to me and, 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 and a mission. And I say, I told myself, okay, <laughs> I will just do something for them. And, and after that, I, I found how. Yeah. Obviously, you know, we all as humans, as consumers, have a role in the changing climate in global warming but how does it feel for you to be all the way in the middle of the south pacific so far from the big industrialized nations that are emitting vast amounts of carbon pollution that is causing the warming sea how does it feel for you to look and see the coral that you love dying as a result of this behavior that's happening all around the world yeah, for sure, it's it's it just it's just it's just crazy when you think about it. Like the corals, uh, which are in my little coral garden in front of my house on the French Grand Reef, they are losing their colors every year and and dying more and more because not only because of the human pressures of our islands, but but mostly because of everyone carbon footprint, like you say, like global warming. That's that's why I like to call it a global issue, because we are all breathing the same oxygen and half of it coming from, from the ocean with healthy coral reef. And we are all also contributing to global warming. And then that's the main reason why the corals in front of my house are dying. And it's, it's pretty sad. So that's why I had different options. But I knew that I needed to, to spread my message uh, about what was happening to the coral reef, not just around my island, but worldwide, because that, that's everyone need to hear what is going on under the, the, the surface with the coral reef. Yeah. And let's talk about that, because that is what you have done so exceptionally well. You're 17 years old and you, uh, you establish and launch Coral Gardeners. And in, in four years, five years, you have just achieve so much. So why don't you tell us a little bit about Coral Gardeners, um, the model uh, and, you know, some of the success stories so far. Yeah, sure. First of all, uh, when I was 16 years old and I wanted to dedicate my life saving the ocean, I went to every scientific institute studying coral reef and I told them, hey guys, I'm 16, I'm in love with coral reef and I want to do something before it's too late. Uh, what can I do? And they say, hey, little buddy, keep calm, finish your high school. Then you're going to do a, a three years a biology degree, then a marine, bi- marine biology a master degree. And then if you are sharp enough, a PhD. And then seven, seven eight years later, you're going to come back, see us, and we're going to decide what we can do together or not. <laughs> and I was like, guys, I, I'm just done with school. I, I'm... I'm I'm not enjoying my time at school since since couple of years now, and I just want to start acting and doing something. So I was a little bit sad, so I didn't know what to do. And obviously, I, I was interested by science, and I was following a lot of science during high school, but I didn't want to finish in a labor, laboratory studying core if I wanted to to start from ideas and 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 start project and being in the field. And um, so I went to study business school because I didn't know what to do, really. And I told myself I will uh, do the same as my parents to sell some pearls from the pearl farm and etc. But 
deep inside me that wasn't what I wanted to do. So uh, at school, uh, one day I was just tired of following the university during the first year. And, uh, and I took my phone and I called my parents and I say, okay, guys, sorry, but I'm dropping out. I won't be at school tomorrow. And then I stopped the phone call. And uh, they called me back. They sent me a, a text of Charlie Chaplin talking about the school system and etc. And that was the most beautiful day of my life. I was 18 years old at that time. And uh, I knew that from this day, my parents would support me, but would never give me any more money. So I started uh, selling some pearls to every hotel, uh, villages in France to make a little bit of money to, to invest in the project, but also to travel, etc. And uh, but I knew that from this day, uh, every energy, every work hour that I would put would be in something that I love, starting my own project. So I launched Core Gardeners in 2017, uh, doing a conference, talking in front of almost 100 people and launching on, on the side a crowdfunding campaign. And since it's been four years now that uh, we launched the project and I will never imagine uh, all the things that I learned that I experienced and that we achieved with my little team and we've starting with from my bedroom, we've removed the bed, I put some desk, some paper, and I was writing all my dreams, ideas. And my little brother, Ioane, was 14 years old. I had couple island friends and, and I always thought that nothing was impossible and that with, with the story we have, with the passion we have, we can connect with the right people and achieve our dreams. And that's what we did. I uh, just, start meeting interesting people and building a team with scientists, uh, kind of a, a lawyers to help me on the administrative legal side. And, um, and, and we moved from my bedroom to a little bungalow and from a place. And now we have a full-time team of 24 people from engineers from the Silicon Valley who work with Elon Musk in the past, from a marine biologists with more than 10 years of experience planting coral. They really know what they are doing and experts in communication, et cetera. And they are, they are, they are, I'm so glad because they believe in my vision and uh, with the right team, uh, we can execute the plan and, and start uh, uh, approaching our goals here. Yeah. It's truly captivating that you have been able to achieve so much in, in just four years. There's probably so yeah. many different elements that have come together to make it so successful, but is there one, two, or three things that you really think have been the differentiator which has led to you becoming so successful? Yeah, sure. I, I have definitely three, three ideas coming to mind. Uh, the first one would be the adoption program because when I was starting the project, I had no academic background, no experience, no credibility. So I knew I will not be able to get governmental funding or any grants. Uh, so I need to be smart in terms of, of finding the right model to, to, to have the money to fund all the operation and the different projects that we wanted to do. Uh, so I thought about this adoption program and I remember uh, just creating the website myself and for every adoption, creating the call certificate and and sending it to the person who adopted the coral it was 25 euros at that time. And, uh, and thanks to this wonderful program, that's why we exist. And we had more, since the beginning of the project, we had more than 25,000 coral adoptions from every countries in the world. And that's how I can uh, talk about my project today. And, and now it's super coral. So it's, we, we choose 10 super coral that people can adopt. The, they write a name of, and they are at the nursery growing and then we're gonna send some news, etc. So that's a way uh, for everyone to join the project and to support our efforts. So I think the, the, the adoption program was really a, a smart idea uh, and uh, we will not be able to have the team and etc. at Core Gardeners, we have a unique business model. We have, uh, we have an organization with two entities, the NGO who is handling the philanthropy, sometimes the grants and reinvested in research, development, innovation. And we have the purpose-driven business with no dividend and all the money is reinvested in planting coral, raising awareness, and also sometimes innovation project. I will talk more about it later. 
but we make the we raise the funds from adoption and merchandising sales and partnerships. So that's a unique business model where things are moving fast, you know, and we are independent. And um, and it's interesting. A second thing that I think we can be happy about, proud about, is the awareness impact. Like from Moria, it's a tiny island in the middle of the South Pacific Ocean, 17,000 inhabitants. And with our creativity and communication skills and the people who join, we were able to launch some really interesting uh, awareness campaigns. And in December 2019, we launched a, a campaign with uh, influencer Alexis Tren uh, with one video that, that had more than 70 million views only on one video on Instagram. That's one of the most uh, video ever watched on the Instagram only. So in four years, we were able to raise awareness and reach more than a hundred billion people from our little islands. Uh, and we ha have now a community of half million people following our daily work. And I think the awareness part of core gardeners and the, the impact we had is, on that side is just crazy. We receive hundreds of thousands of, of messages from all around the world of people my age who just wanted to, to start doing things for the ocean and the coral reef. And it's so amazing when you think about it. And, um, and third thing, I would say it's the restoration program because when I started planting corals, I knew nothing about it. Like I was trying my best planting this type of coral here and just experimenting. And then our methods really evolve a lot along the years, meeting different experts and scientists. And today I'm proud to say that we have a really uh, focused uh, way of working with our corals and really efficient methods and great results. And I'm and we're coming from a long way, and I'm really proud of, of the scientists and the refrigeration team for that year. Yeah, congratulations, man. That is really just so, so impressive. Um, I do agree that the, the second point there around your creativity and communications is really what, um, alongside all the other remarkable work you are doing, is certainly what stands out for me because as an ocean conservationist, you know, I've spent a long time trying to inspire people to take action. And unless you can really take people into the ocean, into that world that they may or may not ever really get to experience, you're never going to be able to inspire them and to get them to protect what they love. And so when you go and look at the Coral Gardeners communications and you see those videos that have been seen tens of millions of times, it takes you there. It takes you into the restoration projects and lets you see the people and the places and the corals, which of course they can then become so intimately connected with through the adoption scheme. So it really is a beautiful model. You mentioned there a little bit about the changing model, starting out as a sole NGO and then going down this uh, purpose-driven business model. Can you elaborate a little bit more about that and, and the reasons for, for, for shifting from just a sole NGO to having a, a business element as well? Yeah, sure. No, thank, you for, thank you for your support. We, when I started the project, I knew that it was really important to be able to share uh, what we were doing. And, uh, and the story and have something really like conservation, ocean conservation needs to be cool and sexy, you know, if you want to talk to, to young people. And I think it's really important for all the people supporting our daily efforts to be able to live the journey with us. So I, I, I started as the creative director of the project because I love taking pictures. I started underwater photography at the early, uh, at a very young age and uh, doing videos and etc. And I always knew that was the, a really a key uh, element of the recipe. And um, we, we spent nights and days just working on, on having great uh, communication and story uh, lines and, and campaigns for, for the people around the world to just follow what we are doing. And um, talking about the chief we, we face, so, we started the project uh, 
so on, only operating as a non-profit, so an, an NGO. We started during three years like this with volunteers and with people who were giving uh, us a little bit of their time aside from their regular job. And uh, I saw the limits of uh, only operating in the nonprofit sector where things are sometimes taking a lot of years, a lot of time. Like if you, if you think about it, like there are, there are organizations out there who have been here from decades and sometimes I, 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 I don't see a, enough impact, you know? So coral gardeners exist to revolutionize ocean conservation and create a worldwide movement to save the reef. And by, by revolutionizing things, you need to think differently. So when I saw the limits of having only volunteers and et cetera, and, and running after grants, governmental funding, I, I, I told myself we will lose too much time and we won't have enough impact. So I made the smart and bold decision to create a purpose-driven business on the side of our NGO. So we could have a full-time team with people making a career out of that and uh, just thinking about how to maximize their impact for the reef every day, every week, all year long. And, uh, and where things are moving faster, we are independent, we, our committee uh, is giving us the, the revenue we need to continue our mission. And, uh, and where we don't lose too much time running after grants, you know? And uh, I'm glad we made this choice because it's a completely different mindset, you know? And we need to be really um, transparent because obviously all the money is reinvested in our mission to help the coral reef ecosystems. And so it's really important that every year we come up with the right impact report saying where the money is going, what we achieved during this year, and what we, where we want to go and also the role of everyone. So it's, it's, it's adding us a little bit more job to be fully transparent, but I think that's the way to go. And think about it. If tomorrow we are not able to, 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 to have the ecology and economy meeting together, I don't see a future for our planet. We need more purpose-driven business. We need more people being able to do good for the planet while working. And I want to be pioneers in this year. Oh, I love it, mate. And you're definitely speaking the language of Ocean Impact Organization and what we're really passionate about. Um, so some of those business model elements uh, within the purpose-driven model, like how are they different from what the NGO was doing? Like, is there some significant changes there, different customers? Where are some of those revenue uh, lines coming from with the purpose-driven business? Yeah, sure. So we are not focusing really on, on donation anymore. When we were uh, with the NGO, it's while more donations. And, and I, I, I think today it's really interesting because our business model is a part also of our mission. Because those, those like thousands of people who adopted the coral in the past, they are not only contributing to fund the entire operation and mission of coral gardeners, but they are also being a part of that of that awareness program. They are learning more about their coral and they are contributing directly to, to, to the field work. And um, so, and also they are representing the movement, like someone in, living in Australia wearing our hat or eco-friendly merch is, is proudly talking about the movement, spreading the word and, and representing the, the, the project. So today with the, Purpose-driven business, we are really focusing on super coral adoptions, uh, but also uh, on developing a community. So a way for people to join by adopting the coral, then they're going to be able to do some, some things to help us increase our impact uh, for the coral reef. But also we are trying to develop new products that can talk to a younger audience, like maybe eco-friendly merch, having the right partners, with uh, the best standards in creating our, our merch. And because people, they also like our identity and a unique uh, communication style. So I think that could be really interesting to develop the true identity all around the world, creating movements and also the partnership. Today, uh, half of our uh, business model is coming from uh, brands that we love, sharing the same 
commitment and values and that really want to to get involved saving the coral reef with us so they are we are creating stories with them during a year-long partnership or more and uh, those brands are really just giving wings to the project and helping he helping us scale up what we are doing here yeah awesome reminds me a little bit of um so we run an annual campaign called the ocean impact pitch fest which is essentially yeah. a competition for startups that are working to improve the health of the ocean to apply to share their solution show how they're progressing and scaling and one of the finalists from 2020 was coral vita who are from the bahamas oh, yeah. and you know one of their interesting pivots i suppose with their business model was now selling reef restoration as a service. So targeting tourism hotspots where reefs are in decline and looking at how they can start to sell their uh, their restoration as a service. Has that come up for you? I know in your impact report, there's, there's quite a few sites that are close to certain tourism developments and hotels. Is that part of the model? Yeah, sure. First, I, I really love what they are doing, Coral Vita, really inspiring. And uh, yeah, with Coral Gardeners, you know, at the beginning, we were really trying to find ourselves and know what is our mission, vision and strategy for the next five years. And uh, I'm glad in 2020, I had time to really reflect on the journey we had. And with a wonderful lady called Karin, we took almost a year refining all our strategy and vision and model, operating model, et cetera. And, uh, but at the beginning, we were trying everything like from donation, adoption, merch, ecotourism, reef restoration services. And we were, we were everywhere. And uh, after I learned that by being everywhere, you, don't, uh, you, you just can't do things the best way you want. And so I told my team, we're going to really focus on one or two things, but we're going to do them. Uh, I, I, as much like really well and um and but in the beginning yeah we brought like a lot of tourists from hotels from from Oria in the water and that was some of the of my favorite memories having uh, like old ladies with me in, in the in the water just planting a coral for their grandson and and, and telling me that out of their three weeks in French Polynesia that their favorite unique one moment to be with the coral gardeners in the water restoring the reef. Uh, we brought more than 2,000 people in the water raising awareness. That was interesting, but I would say it's a global issue. It's, a, it's the global warming. We need to talk to the, to the worldwide audience and the coral adoption program can help us achieve those goals. So that's why we're really focusing on this, the product side of coral gardeners and also the partnership because with interesting companies, we can just scale up the, the the message and and the reach of our actions yeah smart move sounds like you've taken that time and really come up with some strong strategies moving forwards let's talk a little bit about these super corals you've touched on them a few times uh perhaps just tell us a little bit more around the methodology the science what you've found through your um your various processes when it comes to super corals and how this is becoming a key pillar of yours moving forwards. Yeah, sure. So when I started planting corals when I was 16 years old, I was just looking for uh, fragments of opportunity. So broken loose fragments on the seafloor, broken by the fins of the tourists, the anchor of the boat or the storms. But they were uh, in contact with the sand where there are a lot of bacteria and disease. So the results were less impressive. And uh, we were just putting them on bamboo stem so they can grow and then uh, drilling dead areas of the reef to put the bamboo stem and having our little ground coral uh, in touch with the dead coral substrate to be able to restore the, the area. And then we, we had experts like Dr. Austin Kerbai from Fiji was one of the pioneers of reef restoration. We have people who were at James Cook University from Australia who came to, to train us and we learn different uh, recipe, different methods. And uh, today, I think it's really interesting the, the, the method we have with super corals because if, if you have to plant some corals, it, 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 will, it will make more sense to plant some resilient one because of global warming. So that's, that's the idea with super corals. 
with the team during the bleaching events. We're gonna we're gonna monitor different areas of the reef, and we're gonna uh, find the idea is to find the mother colonies, so the big corals, uh, which are better at facing the bleaching events, the rising temperatures of the water, and which are more resilient. And those are the corals we're going to work with. So we're going to fragment 10% of the mother colony. Those 10%, those fragments, we're going to place them on coral rubs, coral trees, or cookies on our super coral nurseries during a period of 12 to 18 months. So before they are grown enough, mature adult size, and where with the one, we're going to plant them back onto uh, damaged areas of the reef with marine cement. So we are creating patches of, of more resilient coral that we call the super corals. And so when, when after Copolia, when they're going to spawn, there is more chances that the reef around it is going to be more resilient. So we are gaining a little bit more time. But I'm so... Uh, I, I can't wait to see all the wonderful studies that couple of scientists around the world are doing right now on the genotypes and the super corals to uh, improve even more our methodology and have more su successful results. But uh, I, I, I like the, the strategy so far. Yeah. yeah, it sounds like a great strategy. And obviously for those people that are listening in and thinking, wow, um, this is really something that speaks to me like people have the opportunity to not only support the work that you're doing but to adopt these super corals you want to tell us a little bit about how that process works and how simple it is yeah sure so the idea was to find a business model we're going to directly connect uh, our supporters to our field work like straight link so uh, we in all those those super coral colonies that our scientists and refrigeration team are choosing, the resilient corals, we found 10 of them, which are the, our, our favorite one, which are growing the fragments, 10% fragments of them are growing in our nurseries. And those are the 10 super coral uh, that people can adopt on our website, coralgardeners.org. So they choose their favorite super coral, they design their super coral card, give a name, and then they can choose receiving the, the, the print uh, version of it or just the digital uh, version of the coral card. And then they embark on a journey with, with us. They're gonna, they're gonna, they are going to learn more about their coral, about how we are, what we are doing with their coral, the results, the growth, the number of species uh, starting to, to live in their coral. And it's a, it's a couple month journey that they're gonna live to learn more about how we plant corals and just learn more about how their super corals are fragments are doing yeah and people can do this from 25 euros from all around the world and i would say today that's the, the the best way for them to to help us and to join our movement yeah there you go folks you've uh, you've got the the knowledge now on how you can go and and learn more and and get involved as we start to wrap up this conversation um i guess i wanted to talk a little bit about you know, the responsibilities on you as a founder and CEO, it's obviously comes with a lot of pressure sometimes, particularly when you've got, you said, 24 staff or something before and um, a lot of expectations on you. Like how, how, did, how do you cope, I suppose, with those pressures of being a founder? Um, do you have any sort of words of advice or wisdom that you can offer other young entrepreneurs the world over who are looking for a bit of guidance through their journey yeah no sure i just turned 23 years old so i i, I still have so many so many things to learn as a young leader and ceo uh, but for sure it's not always easy like uh, like you said i have more and more responsibilities with the team growing the expectations the goals the strategy we are choosing so it's almost learning a, 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 a job without any reference point, without any experience, past experience. I need to imagine how things work in other successful uh, companies, visualize it, uh, and then try it at core gardeners. And uh, uh, we made some mistakes in the past, think we could be better, but overall I think I made some uh, good decisions. 
and uh, we took some, we, we made some right, right moves. And I was really lucky to have amazing people who inspired me a lot uh, and, and gave me so many advices. But um, I would say for all the young people uh, who want to start something like, like my project, uh, you just first need to, to, to believe in it. Like I, I, I was telling my parents the other day, I don't think I would be able to put the same amount of energy right now uh, at 23 that when I was 18, just running after my dreams and, and I said, try work days and night, like putting 13 to 15 hours a day work and really working just hard and doing things I love and, and, and believing in, in our dreams and, 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 and connecting with the right people. And then you learn how to delegate and you stop micro, micromanaging and you just start to, to, to think like less is more and, and focus on really efficient and smart uh, projects and directions. And you learn also how to control your up and downs and having some morning routine, doing some sport in the morning and watching in, inspiring talks. So it's a process. It's a journey. It's for sure not always easy. Sometimes uh, you're, you're too much under pressure and uh, you just don't have like clear vision of where you want to go. But overall, I don't see myself doing anything else. Um, I, I'm, I'm so lucky to be able to, to just dream about my future for and, and the impact I want to have for the reef and having all those wonderful people in my team following me. And, and, and without them, I, I know one thing that I, is that I can't do anything. I, we need the, the best team. And, um, and it's just doing things you love and working hard and, uh, and sharing your passion, talking straight. And, uh, and I think on the long run, it, it's going to pay. Yeah. Mm, thanks for sharing all that um, great advice and experiences. So, yeah, look, as we wrap up the conversation today, um, I'd like to hand it over to you. Is there anything that you'd like to talk about today that you haven't yet or things that have popped up for you in the conversation you'd like to speak to? Um, any closing words from you? Yeah, no, sure. Uh, first, thanks for having me, huh, Tim. Really uh, always a pleasure talking about uh, our project, Core Gardeners. Uh, no, I think if I had to, to say one last thing is that it's just crazy that today uh, in our modern day uh, world, we have so many uh, tools to be able to, to put our ideas on paper and just work achieving them. And we can connect with so many people uh, wherever you are. And uh, from my tiny island, there is not a lot of entrepreneurs here. We are, don't have a lot of uh, synergies and et cetera. But I was able to to follow inspiring journey and stories that that talk to me and and I think like today it's no it's it's about finding your purpose and at the beginning you may not know it's it's the thing you want to do for your life but you need to try and by trying things and learning about different topics you may find some interesting ones and then you just need to to push towards it. And I, and I hope that the next generation, they're going to understand that it's, it's over. It's not about fame or wealth or money. It's, it's about finding something, a good life and impactful uh, career for the future of uh, our planet and humanity. And it's not about saving ourselves. It's about, it's not about saving the world. The planet's about really saving us. And, and, and if we want to stay on, on this planet on the long run, so, it's, it's about us, the young people, to, to really consider what success means and start doing things we love and impactful uh, things, yeah. Situan, you've got uh, so much wisdom to, to share for someone who's 23 years old and you've already achieved so much. And I, for one, look really forward to following your personal journey and that of Coral Gardeners and of the entire reef protection and restoration community the world over. So thank you um, on behalf of all our Ocean Impact community for what you do and for your time today. Do you want to just close up by saying where people can find out more information about you and about Coral Gardeners? 
Sure, yeah. Thank you, Tim, for your time and support and just for spreading awareness around the ocean all around the world. And uh, people can find more about uh, Coral Gardeners and our uh, project on social medias like Instagram or on our website, coralgardeners.org. They can adopt to Coral or just send us messages and, and support our work. And we're just starting. We'll do more in the future. And, uh, and it's on, yeah. Thanks, mate. Keep up the great work. 